Mark chapter 13, the destruction of the temple and the signs of the end times. As Jesus was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on top of the other. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places, and famines. These are the beginnings of the birth pains. You must be on your guard. You will be handed over to local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before the governors and the kings and witness to them. As the, and the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given to you at the time, for this is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will bell against their parents and have them put to death. Everyone will hate you because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one go on the house top. Let no one on the house top go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for a pregnant woman and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be the days of distress unequal from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So be on your guard. I have told you everything in advance. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, people will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that the summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. The day and the hour are known. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servant in charge, each with their assigned tasks, and tells the one on the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the cock crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Wow, that was a hefty passage. So let me just take a moment to pray before I start. Lord, thank you so much for that word. Thank you so much for that reading from Anna, read so beautifully. And um, Lord, it's a, it's a challenging passage. Uh, it's, it's disorientating, it's difficult, but it's your words, Jesus. And we know that you have something to tell us today through your word, your scripture, your teaching that was um, recorded by Mark that was handed over to your disciples so that it could be handed on to our generation. So I just pray, Lord, that you would use my words. Um, we're all sinners, including myself, but Lord, just use what I bring this um, morning, this evening, if you're watching today, please use it for your glory. So it's a long passage the signs of the end of the age um, and there's a lot of stuff in there but I think that we can boil it all down to two instructions from Jesus and those two instructions are don't be alarmed but do stay alert or in other words 
don't be afraid, but do stay awake. Um, because those are imperatives that come through over and over and over again in this chapter of Mark's Gospel. So just to demonstrate that, I want to tell you a story about a hero of mine. His name um, is Oscar Romero. Oscar Romero was the Archbishop of San Salvador in the country of El Salvador at the end of the 70s in 1979 he was the bishop and in 1979 a military government that was very oppressive took over in the country of El Salvador they were very oppressive they were very authoritarian they would stamp out anyone who disagreed with them they would kidnap people torture people people would disappear there was a lot of violence especially against the um, more economically deprived people who were working the farmland in the countryside. Oscar Romero, he would broadcast his sermons every week to the whole country. They were listened to across the country and he was very critical of, well, understandably so, he was very critical, as were many people in the church at that time, of that particular government. Now, what happened in um, February 1980 was Oscar Romero, he sent a letter to Jimmy Carter, who was the president of the United States at the time. And he sent Jimmy Carter a letter. And the reason is this. Um, the US, they wanted to bring stability to the country of El Salvador. They knew that the government was facing a lot of opposition from um, insurrectionists and rebellious groups. They decided the best way to fix that problem was to give a ton of military support and military aid to the government. Oscar Romero sent a letter to Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States, and he said, please stop sending military aid, military support to the government. The more support you give them, the more violent they become. The cycles of violence are spiraling out of control here. We're on the brink of a civil war and things are just going to keep getting worse if something doesn't change. And the way that you're trying to deal with a problem is not working. So he sent that letter in February and um, probably word got out that he had sent that letter. And so then in March, March 23rd, 1980, Oscar Romero, in his radio sermon that was listened to across the country of El Salvador, he pled, you know, he was pleading. He begged the soldiers, if you are a Christian, if you're a soldier and you're following this military government, please lay down your arms stop killing civilians this is not what jesus wants you should obey the um, commands of god which are higher than the commands of the government so that broadcast went out across the whole country the next day oscar romero he was presiding over mass in a little hospital chapel he finished his sermon he stepped towards the altar ready to do the mass a car stopped outside the chapel a man stepped out of the car, stepped into the, cha and into the chapel, shot Oscar Romero in the heart and left and Oscar Romero died. And he died because he was prophetically speaking out against injustice in that nation. He was prophetically disrupting the systems of oppression. And he, w he actually prophetically predicted that if something didn't change, things would get worse. And even after he died, his predictions came true because there was more than a decade of brutal civil war in El Salvador in the 1980s, which in many ways the country is still recovering from. So why am I telling you about Oscar Romero? Well, we, um, the church, the Catholic church, the Anglican church, He's actually been sainted now. We remembered him this week because uh, the 24th of March, which was the day he died, passed this week. So we remembered him this week. But there's actually a really um, important link, I think, between what Oscar Romero did, the way he died, and what Jesus is talking about in this passage that we read today and the way Jesus died. Today's Palm Sunday. So we don't just remember this speech. We remember the whole, the whole story of Jesus' triumphal entry. He came to Jerusalem as uh, this messianic leader. He did not engage in violence the way that many people were expecting him to. He did cleanse the temple. He did prophesy against the temple. He did call the ruling Sadducees um, thieves and robbers because they were using the temple as a way to economically oppress people in Judea. 
and Jesus was a prophet and he prophesied in this passage that the temple would be destroyed. He said to um, the people, if you do not change your ways, things are going to get much worse. And by the time we get to Mark chapter 13, he's already been rejected by the leaders of the Jewish people and he already knows that it's too late. And he says, within a generation, these awful things are going to happen. Okay, And in the year 70 AD, the Romans came in and they destroyed the temple. And the reason they came in and they destroyed the temple is because these zealot movements that were violent, rebellious movements had been gathering more and more and more steam. They had not listened to Jesus' teaching to turn the other cheek. That's all about non-violent resistance. They had not listened to Jesus' teaching about loving your enemies. They had not listened to Jesus' teaching about how everyone, even including the Romans, you know, we see Jesus ministering to Roman centurions in the Gospels, don't we? But the, um, a lot of people, they did not get it and they carried on pursuing their violence and in the end Rome came in they they ransacked Jerusalem and they smashed down the temple and even today there's only one wall left standing so Jesus prophetic words you know Jesus he is he is the messianic king he is a priest the great high priest and he is also the ultimate prophet and and his prophecies also came true and uh, it's, it's a bit confusing, though, because this passage, it uses apocalyptic language to talk about that event when the temple was destroyed. Apocalyptic language. By that, I mean it felt like the end of the world. It literally felt like the end of the world when the temple was destroyed. You know, think about what it felt like for a first century Jew. This temple, it is the symbol of your identity. Everything about you, everything about who you are is wrapped up in this building where you believe that the God you worship is present to you as a people. For the temple to be destroyed, it felt like the whole, it felt like the world would never be the same again. It felt like the world had changed in, in a way, you just, there's no going back now. And it literally felt like the end of the world, like your whole world had been turned upside down. That's why Jesus uses this end of the world kind of language in this passage. And you see the same thing in the Old Testament. Isaiah does it. Jesus actually quotes directly from Isaiah when he talks about um, the sun being darkened, the moon not giving its light, the stars falling from the sky. That's a direct quotation from the book of Isaiah when Isaiah is talking about the fall of Babylon. And of course, when Babylon fell, Babylon was the superpower that gave stability to the region. When Babylon fell, it felt like the end of the world. When Jerusalem fell, it felt like the end of the world. It's also super interesting that Jesus uses language that Isaiah uses about Babylon, and Jesus applies it to Jerusalem. Babylon was judged because of its oppression. Now, in the same way that God judged Babylon because of uh, its oppressive systems of injustice, God is judging Jerusalem in the same way. And that's what the cleansing of the temple was all about. Natasha was talking about the other week. So Jesus was a prophet. And it's really important for us to get into the mind of Mark's original audience. And uh, we cannot underestimate how important that event was, the temple being destroyed. It shaped in, in some way Mark, Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke even more so because we think they were probably written after the temple was destroyed. Um, and Mark may be written just before, but certainly Mark was written when these kind of cycles of violence were already starting to get out of control. That's why in Luke's Gospel, he's particularly, and in the book of Acts, he's particularly concerned to show how the community, the Jesus community, is like a new temple. Because he's saying, guys, it's okay. We, we have Jesus. We have the Holy Spirit. It's okay that the temple was destroyed. Um, Mark doesn't get into it in as much detail, but that's that's actually very important um, for us to understand what it was like for the initial audiences of the Gospels. Um, World-shaking events. That was them. So what about us? Well, we are also living in times where we see the world shaking around us. We are also living in times where we see... Uh, spirals of violence getting out of control. One that I think is particularly important right now is our violence against the planet, against God's creation. You know, we have, you know, we are living a lifestyle 
in which we are exploiting and being violent towards the creation and we're starting to reap the consequences of that. For example, um, you know, one of our students studies global health. She told me something I wasn't aware of a few weeks ago. She said that um, within the scientific community there's really good consensus that actually the rise in global temperatures was a really important contributing factor into the kind of coming to being of COVID-19. It was partly that rise in global temperatures that led to the potential for that virus and maybe more viruses, kind of super viruses that cause pandemics to come into being. So it's, it's, our, it's our violence against the earth and we're reaping the consequences of that. Just like when the temple was destroyed, they were reaping the consequences of their violent ways, you know? Um, systems of oppression, just like Jesus cleansing the temple, we still see those systems of oppression today. Oscar Romero saw them in El Salvador and we still see a lot of inequality today. You know, we're trying to engage with this more as a church. If you haven't heard about it, we're doing a Black Lives Matter book club. That's something to watch out for. Um, but it's the same thing. It's the same thing. And the, and the interesting thing about this passage is Jesus tells us two ways that we can respond when the world is shaking around us. Don't be alarmed, but do be alert. Don't be afraid, but do stay awake. So don't be alarmed, don't be afraid. What does that mean? Well, ultimately, Jesus is in control. He says something amazing in this passage. He says, heaven and earth may pass away, but my words will never pass away. We are standing on the word of Jesus. We're not standing on transient things. We're standing on the eternal words of God. And we believe that it doesn't matter how bad things get, there is hope. And we know that God will redeem and renew and restore his creation. But that isn't, isn't, isn't an excuse for us to do whatever we want. Because <laughs> the other side of it is be alert, stay awake. When God comes back, when Jesus returns to his bride and to renew the creation, is he, is he going to catch us napping? Or is he going to catch us engaging? Is he going to find us um, already starting out on that new creation work? Are we going to be a sign and a foretaste of the new creation? Are we going to be communicating something beautiful to the world around us? Something amazing about the new creation that's coming? Or are we going to be asleep? <laughs> are we going to have become so comfortable in the stuff that we're doing? that Jesus is going to come back and he's going to find us asleep and he's going to be shaking us saying, wake up! <laughs> so I hope that it's going to be the first of those. I hope that when Jesus returns, he is going to find us alert. He is going to find us engaged. He is going to find us engaged in the struggles against injustice, that he is going to find us engaged, giving a voice to the creation, the planet. It doesn't have a voice. The only voice it has is the voice that we give it, you know? It's beautiful that when Jesus overturns the tables he sets all the animals free <laughs> it's a nice little detail there we are called to love god's creation that's a real challenge for our generation they were on the brink of destruction in 30 a.d when jesus prophesied that things were going to get worse they were on the brink of chaos in el salvador in 1980, when Oscar Romero prophesied that if things did not get worse, uh, if they did not change their ways, things were going to get worse. We are also on the brink of apocalyptic events if we do not change our ways. So, don't be alarmed, but do be alert. Don't be afraid, but do be awake do be engaged. When Jesus comes back, we want him to rejoice that the church, his bride, has already started the amazing work of seeing new creation and seeing his kingdom come so that when he comes to bring it into that fullness, we've already made a start. So I just want to pray for us now. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you that even though heaven and earth may pass away, even though heaven and earth may be completely transformed, 
Um, your words will never pass away. We're standing on your words. We're standing on your promises today. Lord, give us your heart for the world around us. Give us your heart for injustice, um, systems of oppression, racial injustice, economic injustice, social injustice, gender, sexuality, every kind of injustice we see, Lord. Give us a heart to see more of your justice. And when it comes to your beautiful creation, Lord, we know that we're facing apocalyptic events. We've just lived through 12 months of pandemic and it has felt like we're in the end times. We're in apocalyptic times. Lord, please let us be a people that prophesies, that prophesies in the spirit, that um, prophesies your word, that we would see a change, that we would see a turning back um, a turning away from these ways that we're being violent to the planet, that we would be able to step into a restored relationship with creation once again. So I pray that for everyone listening now, as Natasha says, beautiful phrase, everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, would you empower us with your Holy Spirit to be people that bring transformation, to be people that bring your kingdom, to be people that bring a foretaste of your new creation. In Jesus' name, amen.